me all the time. Just earlier to that, from the mid, just after mid-90s onwards, I kept coming across people who were telling me they'd seen apparently human people uh, turn into a reptilian form and then go back again in front of their eyes. And you think, okay, um, right, back burner with that one. But as the months and the years passed, these were coming at me all over the world. Um, and then I started looking at um, ancient texts and stuff like that and accounts, and you could find the same stories being told all that apparently time ago. And there are many non-human entities that are interacting with this uh, reality. Um, but the, 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 the theme that kept, keeps coming to me over the years in relation to these bloodlines behind the Illuminati is of some form of reptilian entities, um, which are the next stage on, because uh, it goes on beyond them, but the next stage on behind the Illuminati bloodlines and the interbreeders with them is this reptilian group, which sounds real strange until you go with it. Now, again, this is why the first part today is so important. These n people know that the body is a biological computer. So to them, that's how they look at it. What we call procreation is the downloading of two hard drives, if you like, into one, um, which uh, creates the, the, the offspring. To these people, they see that as a downloading of a computer program. And so the obsession, and this is real, goes right back to the ancient world, right up to the present day, the obsession that these bloodlines have, take royalty, aristocracy, and the, um, the, the major uh, banking and uh, business families of the world, they interbreed incessantly, um, and always have. And it's because, from their point of view, they are holding a software program, which is what? Information. It's a state of being. And when you interbreed that, these hybrid bloodlines, with the general population, that, to them, unique software program, uh, computer program, starts to dilute very, very quickly. So what they're trying to do is hold that um, software, hold that information within the computers by interbreeding um, with each other. The oldest form of religion and worship so far established is serpent worship. It's massive. It goes right back. 70,000 years ago is the, um, the oldest uh, evidence in um, South Africa of serpent um, worship. And after I'd written a book called The Biggest Secret, when I introduced this for the first time, I went to speak in South Africa, and I met uh, this man, Credo Muchwa, who contacted the organizers of my event and said, I want to talk to this, this man. So I went to see him, and I spent days with him in the end. And he, he first said to me, he said, Mr. David, he said, how do you know about the Chittahuri? And I said, well, who are they? He said they are the, the children of the serpent, the children of the python. That's what Chittahuri translates as. And he told me that when the colonial powers came into Africa, as everywhere else, they targeted the shaman and the carriers of the ancient knowledge and the ancient history of that area. And in his words, they milked the minds of the shaman and then killed them. So to keep the knowledge um, alive, the shaman streams started to create their own secret societies with horrendous initiation um, rituals to make sure you really wanted the knowledge. Um, and they carried it underground so it would survive. Because the, what the colonial powers wanted, in other words, these bloodlines behind the colonial powers, they wanted to destroy as much of the ancient knowledge as possible because then they could impose their own version of history which would write out what they didn't want people to know. So um, about, uh, what is he now, 90? Crikey. 60 years ago nearly, he was initiated into these secret societies in South Africa, and that's when he learned about the Chittahuri, and he's gone on learning ever since. That is a painting. He's a brilliant man. He's a library on legs. That's one of his uh, paintings of one um, 
kind of the chitter hurry, as he calls them. There are many different types, as there are different types of uh, human. And he showed me this, uh, what he calls the necklace of the mysteries. Um, it's mentioned 500 years ago in accounts. He reckons it's at least 1,000 years old. And he calls it a necklace. You put it on your shoulders. Oh, my God, it's so heavy. And he sits there for hours with it. I don't know how he does it. Um, and what he does, because he's the official storyteller of the Zulu nation, what he does is use these symbols to tell the story of Africa, the people of Africa. And right at pride of place at the front is a human woman and a very clearly non-human man with a big willy in come and get me mode. And interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, he says that was um, originally gold. And then someone stole it and they couldn't replace it with gold, so they replaced it with copper. But then again, this is southern Africa. You go to North Africa and the, one of the key foundation stories and myths of ancient Egypt is of the golden penis of Osiris. And the more and more that I see this, these are symbolic of this bloodline, of this uh, connection, these, this, this hybrid uh, bloodline connection. And what um, Credo was saying, yeah, I used to go out with someone like that. It was good. That's the lady. And here's the, um, here's the, here's the guy. Now, he doesn't look very reptilian. I pointed that out to him. Uh, and he said, this is the story. The Chidahori, in the, uh, when they were manifesting openly in some areas, um, said, you must never portray us as we really are, otherwise deaf. So he said, what people did is they portrayed them as clearly not human, in various, in very many, in various ways, but not actually as they really looked. Although if you go one stage back from Sumer, in the same area, which was the Ubaid culture, which preceded Sumer in Mesopotamia, now Iraq, you do find in, in, in the graves of uh, Ubaid graves, there have been found very clearly representations of reptilian uh, mothers and babies and all the rest of it. This is a, 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 a symbolic image by Neil Haig of this hybrid bloodline, which has, a, we all have, and I'll come to this, we all have reptilian genetics, very, very serious reptilian genetics within the body hologram computer, but these hybrid uh, bloodlines have much more um, reptilian genetics and therefore um, have much more of the reptilian genetic personality, if you like. And around the world, again, it's like, um, have you seen that new car? No, and you see them everywhere. Again, once this reptilian thing came into my life, I started to realize just how much reptilian imagery there is everywhere, all over the world. Uh, and and the, um, the ancient myths and stuff like that of the, um, uh, the Nagas in, um, in Asia, the uh, people who were said to be part reptilian, part human, and could uh, move between the two. And uh, the many images you find portrayed of this uh, coming together of um, earth women and these, this reptilian race and part human, part non-human and, and uh, all the rest of it. These are just a few examples that have been sent to me from around the world but crikey there's loads and loads of them that uh, portray the same basic symbol of again fighting the snake, fighting the dragon is all part of it. And of course the very, one of the key stories in the Bible is of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, which when you read that story um, in the way it's uh, portrayed, absolutely changed the way that humans um, uh, acted and saw themselves in the world. And you see the symbolic way that it's uh, talked about. And I was on a Christian um, radio station in America a few months back, and uh, you know, they said, oh no, serpents and all that. I said, well, hold on a second. Do you think that if you believe the Garden of Eden story, and again, the Garden of Eden story told in different ways using different names, you can find that all over the world as well. Same recurring theme. And uh, I said, do you really think that uh, if you believe it to be, that, that, that the, the serpent in the Garden of Eden was a snake on the ground? Did you know? Could you think it could be some, that could be symbolic of something? And uh, it's just another example of the, um, the reptilian symbolism all over the place. And when you, um, 
you look at the castles and the, the stately homes of these bloodlines in the aristocracy and also in the churches as well, and they're behind them, and they were behind the building of them, um, then again, you find these what we call gargoyles that have a, a reptilian feel about them. And the coats of arms of so many of these aristocratic families carry the dragon um, in various forms. Some people, and there is a lot of truth and accuracy in it, describe London as Babby London because that is, became the new center of this bloodline network. And that's why this tiny bloody country just off the coast of Europe had that empire that spanned the world. How could that be? Because the, that was the the, the, the center of their operations and therefore was the center of their empire. And so appropriately, the, the very symbol of the city of London, the financial district, the original city of London, where St. Paul's Cathedral is and all the financial stuff where they've messed around with the global financial situation as we're currently experiencing, um, the symbol is two flying reptiles holding the shield of a very significant secret society within the Illuminati web called the Knights Templar that control London. Here it is. Very appropriate, and I would suggest not without coincidence, or not coincidence. When you pass into the city of London from the main uh, urban sprawl of London and stuff, um, you pass these flying reptiles on each side of the road holding this Knights Templar shield. Um, and the district of the city of London, which controls so much of world finance, runs into what is known as the Temple in London, which is named after a Knights Templar temple. And, at the point, and, and that's the, where um, so much of the global, not just British, but the global and certainly the Commonwealth uh, law network is controlled from. At the point where those two meet, the city of London and the temple, is this flying reptile at the, uh, in the center of the road at a place called Temple Bar. And then when you, 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 you look at the recurring themes of, of, of dragons and reptilian uh, monster figures in, and, in myths and stories, they, uh, they go on and on and on. And of course, the whole basis of the Chinese culture and many of the Eastern cultures is of the dragon. And yes, you know, things like ley lines were symbolized as dragon lines and all the rest of it, but that's not the only explanation for it. Uh, why would the ancient emperors of China say, um, uh, we, we, we claim to be emperor because of our descendants from the ley lines? I mean, they wouldn't do that. They said descendants from the serpent gods. That was their symbolism of, of the serpent, the gods. The word Messiah comes from Mesa, which is the fat of the Nile crocodile, which they used to use to anoint pharaohs. Christ itself means anointed one. And even the, the, the devil in the um, Bible is described as in, in reptilian terms. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out on, into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And this theme of fallen angels, again, drops into this same theme of this, um, this takeover, which has been gathering pace through the centuries and now is where it is today. This is a painting by Credo Mutwa in <clears throat> South Africa, not far from the Kalahari Desert, which is a painting on his hut, which is symbolizing an ancient uh, African story of the Chittahuri um, and how they ate people. And um, this is Alfa Romeo, which is straight from that uh, ancient myth. I mean, why would Alfa Romeo have a bloody snake in a human? It's a bloody car. And next to it, of course, is the red cross on the white background of the Knights Templar Secret Society. This is a, a, a home of uh, Silvio Berlusconi, who thinks uh, after a, uh, an earthquake disaster, just see it as having 
a weekend of camping. I mean, this man's not real, but he's leader of Italy. And when you saw that story, that's what he said, that the people in that earthquake zone should see it as, a weekend of camping. I mean, you, you, you can't make these people up. They have no empathy. Um, and again, here's that same um, theme. The fairy stories and the, and the uh, fairy tales of, of the frog turning into the prince and all these constant um, themes uh, relates to the same stuff in the ancient uh, world coming through to today. And this is, um, this is, this is, this is a book that's uh, given to some American school children. And it's about um, shape-shifting from reptilian into human. And uh, they say, I'm crazy. And they're giving, it, they're giving it to school kids. Oh, it's just a story. No, it's not. I wish it was. And this is a point. And this has got me tremendous ridicule. I don't care. I'm bothered. But shape-shifting, right? This is another recurring theme. Not just in the endless people now around the world who said, yeah, I saw that. I've experienced that. Um, and, uh, 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 seeing someone move from a human to a reptilian form and back again, you find this too in the ancient accounts, the shapeshifters. And not just into reptilian, but into other forms as well. And then, again, I keep saying it, this is why the first part of this presentation was so important, because without that, we really can't get a fix on some of this stuff. People say, and I understand it completely, you can't shift from a solid body to a solid body and back again. It's daft. I agree completely. You can't. But that's not what's happening. These different physical forms are energetic fields. Let's go back to that, um, that image from earlier of the, the energy field. It goes through the decoding system and becomes an apparently physical um, form that we see in our everyday life. Shape-shifting takes place in one place only, in the decoding system of the brain which again itself is a vibrational field beyond the physical. So you have um, an energy field that is human and you're decoding that into a human body. Then the reptilian level of that comes forward and becomes the dominant field and suddenly you're decoding a different energy field and then it returns and you're decoding this one again. In your decoded reality in the experienced holographic physical world, you see someone human, you see them uh, reptilian, you see them human. Did you see that? It's only going on in here. Of course, shape shifting from solid to solid to solid is impossible, but that's not what it is. How appropriate. <laughs> um, because they're holograms. All physicality is holograms. It is an energetic field. And at the end, the, the, the level of the energetic field, because it's not solid, it's movable, changeable, and then becomes changeable in the decoded reality as we observe it in the head. That's where shape-shifting goes on. And again, we are perceiving, through what we call visible light, a tiny frequency range of um, human sight, human decoding. But just outside of this frequency range and beyond into frequencies well away from this one are endless kind of worlds and realities. And I say uh, further away in that sense, but actually they're all sharing the same space. You know, in this uh, space that I'm um, standing in now are all the radio and television stations broadcasting to Melbourne. I can't see them, they can't see each other because they are operating on different frequencies. And when you tune into one of those frequencies, that's what you get. And what this physical body does is to tune us through that telescope I talked about earlier um, into and through the... Um, receiver transmitter um, uh, crystalline structure, it tunes us into this tiny range of frequencies called visible light, and this becomes the only reality. But interspacing, interspersing this reality is all existence. And just outside of this frequency range, just, just beyond uh, visible light, lie these reptilian entities and many other entities too. And, you know, you, you'll, you'll be in a house and you'll see a cat, for instance, reacting to what is to us empty space. 
And you'll say, what's wrong with a cat? Don't be daft, nothing there. But there, to the cat, there is something there. Because its visual frequency range is much greater than ours, and therefore it's seeing things in the space that we can't see. And it's because this knowledge is kept from us that things that are happening in the world are dismissed as ridiculous and people like me are dismissed as crazy because it's a very simple, very powerful thing. And it's, it sounds a, an obvious truth, but sometimes we miss the obvious truth. People's sense of what's possible comes from what they think is possible. And what they think is possible comes from the information they receive to tell them what is possible. If you suppress the knowledge of what is possible, you suppress their perception of what is possible, and they will laugh in the face of the truth and say it's impossible, when actually, um, it's, it, it, if you, if you, if you uh, understand to a greater level than, than the mainstream allows you to understand, you realize not only is it possible, it's perfectly bloody logical. So, just as we have ghosts, as we call them, which, are, uh, which is energy... Out just outside of our frequency range, and sometimes it just enters our frequency range and we can, we can see it as ethereal. Whereas if it was absolutely on our frequency range, it would look as solid as you and me. It's like a, a radio station not being quite on the dial. You don't get a sharp reception, you get interference. And in the same way, um, these reptilian entities lock into these bloodlines and take over their mental and emotional faculties I've talked to many psychics around the world who have, you know, who have the ability to go further out than the norm in terms of their decoding of, of sight. And they, um, many, many of them have told me how they've seen not just reptilian entities, but often, but other entities too, non-human, who are what they call overshadowing humans uh, as they observe them and locking in into these bottom two um, chakra points here, the base chakra and the one just above. And... What they're doing, because the, the, the um, body's a hologram, is they're locking into that um, human energy field and they're taking over its mental and emotional processes and perception processes. Now, oh, let's go back. There you go. Oh yeah, we'll come to that in a sec. Um, it's all about vibration and vibrational compatibility. These reptilian entities are vibrating to a certain frequency. Humans are vibrating to another frequency. What the hybrid um, idea is about is to infuse as much of this frequency, because that's what it's, it's all about in the end, frequency, because that's the base um, uh, prime reality of, of the hologram. It's to infuse as much of this um, frequency into this frequency to make them as compatible as possible to allow this age-old recurring theme right up to the present day of possession to take place and it's much easier to possess something that you are in vibrational um, resonance with or much closer to it than something that's that, that's uh, very much further out and so these hybrid bloodlines basically are there to create the vehicles that these uh, reptilian entities just outside of this frequency can then take over. And they are manipulating this world through apparently human bodies when if you could see further out, you would see anything but a human overshadowing these people that are in the positions of power. So these guys, I found this uh, picture on the internet, it's very appropriate. These guys are basically empty shells. Um, and they are... Uh, vehicles to, I'm not saying every one of these are, but I think most of them are from what I'm looking at, but, but it, the basic theme is the people in positions of power are merely vehicles for something else that is um, in control of their faculties and control of their um, mind processes. So we have the, sh the, um, the advisors in the shadows within this reality, um, who really are in control of the people who appear to be in power, and then one step back from them, just outside of this visible light dimension, we have these entities that are um, calling, the, calling the, uh, the, the, the shots in, in so many ways through into this reality in terms of what happens here. And after you know, my experience of this 
explanation of the schism and all the rest of it, I, I refer to these now as the schism people. Because they are, this schism resonates out down into this reality, this um, disharmonious um, uh, conflict, uh, chaos, and all the rest of it. And as it plays itself down into this reality, it manifests itself in various ways. And it is in those entities that lock into that schism uh, energy, they manifest its state of being. They are expressions of it. And you find that these people do not have the basic values of compassion, empathy, that most humans have because they're locked into a uh, deeply disharmonious and imbalanced uh, consciousness that um, manifests um, out those values. And so to these people, um, pepper bombing Baghdad, they have no emotional consequence for that at all because they have no empathy. Whereas we would be, we, we couldn't do it because we would have empathy with the consequences for others of their actions. And so they are operating on a completely different point of observation of life, reality, uh, than we are. And therefore, anything goes with these people because of that. And these schism people, as they've, as they've taken control of human society, have created what? A human society that represents that schism. It's division. It's fighting with each other. It's trying to get, um, compete with each other, dominate each other, top dog, up the greasy pole. They're all manifestations of this basic energy disharmony. And so it goes up the levels from the human up through, eventually, um, to this schism energy. And all these things are, ma are manifestations within the decoded holographic world of the state of disharmony of this energetic um, schism which has um, affected life in this reality, this part of it anyway, so fundamentally. So you have these reptilian entities, I'm sure other entities too, but the reptilian thing keeps coming up, who take over the, the, the thought process and mental processes. And we see the human when we decode that energy field of human, but behind it is something looking very different. Um, someone sent me this picture. Um, it may be a, yeah, uh, just a play of the light, but it's symbolic of what so many people see. Uh, some people see full body shifts. Talk to those people all around the world. But what seems to be the common theme more than anything is the eye shift, where they take on a reptilian type um, straight down pupil instead of the round one of the, of, of the human, very much symbolized by this. And a few weeks ago, a scientist friend of mine um, called me and said he'd been chatting to a, an acquaintance of his who's just been doing, I mean, I don't agree with it, but he's just been doing research into iris scan uh, technology which led him to look very closely at 2,300 um, eyes as part of this research. And his friend didn't know anything about my stuff at all. He was just in a conversation, and he said that around 4% of the eyes that he looked at very closely appeared to be of reptilian type and appearance, which is maybe about the percentage we're looking at. Someone sent me this with Father George Bush. I don't know. I think that's, it may, again, a play on the light, almost certainly, but so symbolic, because I know a number of people have seen this guy shift. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a magazine. It's called Fortean Times or something. A few years ago, they ran this front page picture, you know, taking the mick out of me. Um, and I said, thank you very much. That's just very symbolic. I love that. Thanks very much. Um, and so... You find a few of these pictures on the internet now as it gets around. Hey, there you go. Um, and one of the things that I've looked at very closely over the years, particularly to the end of the, towards the end of the years and early, uh, early across 2000 and so, are the mind control projects and the satanic ritual abuse projects um, to help people who've been through that. And um, 
the number of times when people have been through satanic ritual abuse and all the rest of it that they talk about Rept in, reptilian, in reptilian terms about what they experienced. And these were some pictures um, drawn by someone who went through satanic ritual abuse of um, the kind of things that she remembers from what happened in the rituals. And again, as, and the reason the therapist sent these to me, with the person's permission of course, was because she was constantly drawing reptilian imagery because that's what she experienced um, in the ritual. And if you remember um, Rosemary's Baby, that film of the 60s which was um, directed by Roman Polanski, and shall we say he should bloody know, um, with Mia Farrow, and um, she was manipulated by a satanic family to be impregnated, to give birth to this, this child, and at the end of the movie, when you saw briefly the child in the crib, which was a hybrid, it had reptilian eyes very uh, clearly, and... Um, like I say, Roman Polanski should know. So this um, uh, theme of possession goes way, way back through history. And it's possession um, through, um, overwhelmingly in this case, a vibrational compatibility because of this interbreeding. There you go. Good old tone. So what they're talking about him being the first president of Europe now. Crikey, it gets worse, doesn't it? Um, Mr. Fake Smile, Mr. Fake Emotion. What are the things I've noticed about these people? And when I was in the Green Party years ago in Britain, I, I, I saw a number of British politicians close up. And you see their dark eyes and you see something else. Their eyes and their, their face don't talk the same language as I call it. You know, it's, an, it's funny how people are, are, are famous or infamous for their massive smile like Obama and Blair. But when you see the big smile, look at the eyes. Hillary Clinton's a classic. The big smile, the eyes never smile. Cold, steely eyes. But what's behind these people? Just a touch vibrationally out of human sight, behind the painted smile. This guy, Ted Heath, when I, he was Prime Minister of Britain from 1970 to 1974. He was the guy that signed us into the European Union. Um, major person involved in the Bilderberg Group and various other things. And I wasn't into any of this stuff at the time. I was a national spokesman for the British Green Party. And uh, I, um, I, was, I was asked to go and speak on this election program um, on Sky News years ago, back in the 80s, 89 it was. And um, I, I arrive and the lady takes me into this makeup room and we go through the door and it appears to be empty. She says, someone will be along in a minute and walks out. So I sit down in the chair, I'm looking at the mirror and I catch someone just to my right. And I look across and it's this bloke who'd just been um, interviewed on the program and he was sitting there waiting to have the makeup taken off. So, you know, cheery bloke. I said, all right, mate, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. Um, and but no word was spoken by this guy in the entire um, experience. He sat there looking at the mirror and when I said hello, he turned his chair and he looked at me. A very strange look. His, his head never moved once he turned it. Then his eyes started at the top of my head. I went slowly down my body, real slowly, to my feet, and then went back again, and then turned and looked at the mirror. And all I could say, looking back, he was scanning me. The thing was, though, when he was scanning me and I was looking at him, all his eyes, whites as well as everything else, went completely black. And what I've found since is a few things. First of all, this guy was seriously into Satanism, was a major Satanist in Britain, and child abuser. I put it in my books while he was dead now, but I put all this in my books while he was alive. And a journalist rang him and said, you've seen what this David Icke bloke's saying about you? And, oh, he must be mad. And that was the end of it. Because it was true. I talked to the people, he, uh, many people he abused. And the other thing that I found after I had this experience and I got into this stuff after 1990 are the stories around the world of the black-eyed people of which the same story is told. These people's eyes go completely bloody black. And you know, when we look at each other, we make what we call eye contact. But when, you, when I was looking into Ted Heath's eyes, there was no point where there was any contact I, was, I, I described it <clears throat> to my family when I got home. You never, never believe what I've just experienced with Ted Heath. It, I said to them, it's, it was like looking into two black holes. There was no point where there was a, 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 
a contact. And what I understand now is us looking through the physical human energy field into that which um, was behind him, um, that which you never see. So we all thought these people, and if we could see not that far beyond visible light, we'd see something overshadowing these people that is uh, very different to the way they look. Oh, I love that. <laughs> hey. They say a picture tells a thousand words, don't they? Oh, yes. And that's the other thing. And, you know, what are the British royal family famous for? Emotionless behavior towards their offspring and stuff. And you find that a lot with these, not always. And, again, you know, I'll throw this away, but the thing that I've more and more begun to kind of understand, uh, or at least go in, in that direction, seeking more understanding, is that because we live in a digital um, reality on one level, you know, we've seen these adverts, where the, the digital adverts now, where they put in famous actors from the past, from movies, and they put them in with modern actors in, in adverts and stuff. They don't do it so much now, but a few years ago it was very popular. And the real best ones, you can hardly tell the bloody difference, even at that level of technology. The, the, the level we're talking about in terms of the reality and the manipulation, the reality is light years beyond anything that we, we, we have here. And... You know, they talk about sentient programs in the Matrix and, the, you know, the woman in the red dress who appears to be absolutely like everyone else, but is actually just a digital insert. More and more that I understand this, I'm sure there are vast numbers of digital inserts around, and I think a lot of them are these people, actually, um, that are just vehicles for, um, vehicles for this, these other entities just outside of human sight to run this reality. And it seems to me there are three types. There are those that are di digital implants. There are those people in the world who are conscious and, and have the potential to connect to consciousness, but are stuck in mind, which I talked about earlier. And there are those, and thank goodness they're in increasing number as this awakening goes on, who actually are in this reality, but are connecting to levels of awareness beyond it. And uh, that's where the, the, um, the change lies. Oh, Neil Haig knocked this out as a bit of a joke. Uh, the red dress um, bloodlines of um, the uh, digital implants, maybe. This guy, Carl Sagan. What time is it? We're obsessed with time. Uh, I'm not doing too bad. Um, this guy, Carl Sagan, the cos cosmologist, he wrote um, about, in great detail, about the um, impact of reptilian genetics upon humans. Uh, and human behavior, and he wrote this book, the, the Dragons of Eden, going back to history and the talk of dragons and the reptilian and stuff, but also the reptilian genetics that is within all of us. Fundamental part of the human body, the human hologram, is, um, is reptilian genetics, and as this guy said, understanding the um, reptilian background to the, to, to the human uh, body, or the human being as he called it, is to understand so much about human behavior. The oldest part of the human brain is called the R complex by scientists, short for reptilian brain, um, because of the reptilian input that we, we've had um, in our uh, uh, body development. Now, there are other parts of the brain that balance out the characteristics of the reptilian brain, but if you have an infusion of greater reptilian genetics, you are going to have, obviously, a greater infusion of the um, characteristics of the reptilian genetics. And this is mainstream science when they're talking about the reptilian brain. From there, we get primitive emotional responses and emotional responses. Cold-blooded behavior and territoriality, as they call it. This is mine. I own it. I control it. A desire to control. An obsession with hierarchical structures of power, aggression, might is right, winner takes all, come from the reptilian brain. And they are absolutely the characteristics of the Illuminati families. Also from the reptilian brain, we get the um, survival responses, and on that level they're very good, things like fight or flight and all that stuff that gets you out of danger. So, the more... 
we can be put into a sense of survival in our perception and state of mind, the more we are locking in to that reptilian part of the brain, and that's the kind of stadium that these people understand more than any other, and we're being locked into that all the time as we are manipulated to uh, fear not surviving in endless ways. Not just severe uh, fearing not surviving in terms of uh, life and death, but fearing not paying the mortgage at the end of the month, fearing of having your house foreclosed. They all lock you in to a sense of needing to survive. And the other thing that these, uh, these entities do is feed off human energy. And to feed off human energy, they have to pull humans into an energetic state that they can feed off. If you're in a state of harmony, they can't feed off it because never the twain shall meet vibrationally. So they pull us or seek to pull us into a state of disharmony, of stress, of fear, of conflict, of aggression, of anger and all the rest of it. Because that's pulling us into an energetic state that they can then feed off because that's their energetic state. Um, and they seem to operate in what an uh, astrophysicist friend of mine called uh, Giuliana Conforto calls interspace planes, which is like a neutral zone between the dimensions, where you need um, to, as she puts it, find a source of energy because there's not a natural source of energy there on the scale that there is within um, a, a fully-fledged uh, reality dimension, whatever you want to call it. And I said to Credo Mutwa, do you have anything in your culture that relates to interspace planes, these neutral zones? He said, oh yes, he said, we call them the heaven between heavens. He said, that's where the Chittahuri are. Um, and so that, that takes them so close to visible light and the um, reality that we're experiencing. And what they're doing is feeding off human energy by manipulating us into an energetic state in which they can feed off and also to keep us in mind and not open to consciousness. Years ago, last time I came to um, Australia, I had a strange experience. I spoke in Sydney and afterwards I was introduced to this Freemason who said he was 33rd degree or something. He wanted to meet me because he wanted to know how I knew what I knew. He said, yeah, how do you know that? You're not supposed to know these things. So anyway, I met him and he said... Um, I said, I'm a good Freemason, he said. I, I'm, I'm trying to fight some of the bad things. I said, okay. Uh, he said, um, if you come to Canberra, he said, I'll show you around Canberra, and I'll, I'll show you the, the, the Freemasonry imagery. So, okay, I'll go. So I went to Canberra, and I met this guy, and he showed me all around the Parliament building and all the street plan around there and all the rest of it. And then he took me into the, the, um, the war memorial, the war museum memorial in, in Canberra. And my God, it is a blaze with Illuminati and reptilian symbolism. And when you go into the part where the unknown soldier grave is, on the four corners and the pillars are depictions of soldiers, men and women. And then you've got the light coming up from the top of their head going up. And you've got a reptilian um, uh, figure s sitting above that, almost policing the connection to out there and this satanic symbolism and all this stuff and when you look at the um, the sponsors of the war museum um, a number of them are like a who's who of the Illuminati in um, in Australia according to this guy anyway I'll tell you what he said to me he said we need to get you some money I said what do you mean he said yeah he said we need to get you some money to fund what you're doing I said well hold on I said how are you going to do that he said we'll give you a credit card I don't know who we was he said we'll give you a credit card I said well how will that help me he said well we fix the computer system, so no matter how much you spend, it never registers. He says, that's, he says, that's how we get our money, right? So, so anyway, I thought, I'm not sure about that in the least. And we said goodbye. He said, look, I've got lots of things to tell you. And never heard from him again. Disappeared from the face of the bloody earth. Um, he's still around in Australia, I'm sure, but there you go. So... This, this interspace plane is, 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 is one of the kind of, kind of um, stumbling blocks energetically which, which is trying to manipulate us from getting um, uh, connected to the full nature of who we are. So this is kind of, seems to be the, 
the structure, certainly at this level, goes further out up to that schism, I believe, but at this level, you've got the reptilian entities um, and Nephilim, that was the, the name of the hybrid bloodline in the Bible, the Nephilim, uh, just one of many, many names that they're called around the world in different cultures. The reptilian entities um, possess their um, hybrid stooges. And the secret society network within this reality manipulates the stooges and their gophers and agents into the positions of power at the top of the pyramids in all these different countries. These are the subsidiary networks I'm talking about. They then uh, control um, all these other things like politics, finance, media, military, religion, and the royal uh, networks because that locks into them. And then down come the people. And these people at the top who appear in everyday reality and on the news bulletins often to be at odds with each other and fighting each other. And there's a lots of infighting goes on among these people because they're so imbalanced that they're going to, of course they're going to fight for them, among themselves but there is a level that knocks heads together when it gets in the way. And so they're manipulating, playing different um, countries and groups and Islamic and stuff off against each other. And if you notice, the people that declare the wars never bloody fight them. These people go off like silly sods and fight them. And these people who have nothing against these people, but those people tell them they should and, they, and all the rest of it. And the people fight among themselves, creating great stress, great uh, disharmony, energy to be absorbed and all the rest of it. Um, because they're manipulated by the tiny few into this stuff. I mean, if George Bush, boy George Bush, had been in Iraq when the first bullet was fired, he'd have been under a bed in Houston when the second bugger went off. These people do not fight the wars, they just declare them. We fight the wars, and if we stop fighting the sodden wars and came together, we made the whole system completely impotent. So these are schism people coming down the levels of reality and they feed off the energy that we um, generate through our states of emotional and mental states and they manipulate that. Now the one energy they can't take, um, the many energies they can't take, that they're in harmony, but what we call love, the energy of the heart, no way they want anything to do with that. They can't, they can't cope with it and they can't sync with it and they want to shut that energy off and that's what they do by manipulating society and playing us off against each other. There's a guy called uh, Mr. Emoto, a Japanese researcher I spent a long time with, spent a whole weekend with once in London. We actually wrote a book together, funnily enough, um, just not uh, writing but just talking and it all being trans translated. Um, and he's famous for filming... Uh, water crystals um, where he has put the water in contact with various vibrational states and indeed just writing love on the side of the uh, container or hate or putting a mobile phone on it or whatever and what he then does is, and I've seen his, um, his uh, uh, laboratory and stuff in um, Tokyo, he freezes it very very quickly and what is then captured in the water crystal is the vibration of the love on, written on the side. Because uh, you write love, generates love. If that's the, the, the motive of writing love, uh, hate, all the rest of it. So that is what a water crystal exposed to words of love and appreciation looks like. This is what a water crystal looks like when it's exposed to um, hate. Now, that's the world before the schism. This is the world afterwards. And it's this energy that re represented by that crystal that these guys want us to produce and, and the operations, uh, the, the level that they operate on themselves. So we need to be very careful about the way we talk to each other, the way we express things, because if you can put the word love on the side of a container of water and create that difference or hate, imagine what we're doing to the energy field and our own individual energy fields as we interact when we are hurling abuse at each other. But that's what these guys want. That's, they want to conflict. Schism. Break up. 
The society is just a, a manifestation of that schism. So that again is love and appreciation. This is a crystal uh, from water that had a mobile phone tied to it. And everyone's got a mobile phone. Oh, I've got a mobile phone. Very so convenient. Yeah, they burn my brain. It's good. <laughs> Very so convenient. You don't have to get anyone to burn your brain for you. It does it automatically. <laughs> so the idea, and my God, have they, have, 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 have they succeeded up to this point, is to turn humanity at war with itself. That's the way they do it. And uh, in this film, uh, Monsters, Inc., which I took my son to years ago when he was a little boy, I nearly fell off the bloody floor because that was all about monsters going from the monster world where there was no um, uh, source of energy into the human world, frightening children. The scream uh, was caught in a, uh, in a kind of tube and they brought it back to the monster world to um, uh, be the power system of their world. And fear is the biggest, um, not just controller of humanity and suppressor of humanity, it's the biggest uh, creator of this energetic state that they want. The Matrix talked about feeding off human energy and all the rest of it, turning humans into batteries. And that's uh, what we're looking at in terms of the, the way you, uh, the society is created. There are many physical underground um, areas um, which have been reported to contain reptilian and non-human entities and I'm sure that's true within this reality within visible light but it's the ones that are just outside that seem to be the, the cause of this there are many reptilian entities that seem to be very uh, benevolent too but the foundation of it all is puppet people without this none of this other garbage could actually happen that is prime and the idea is to constantly uh, take us in the wrong direction, make us misunderstand ourselves and reality so we act in the ways that suit them. To be in this bewildered state. The world is crazy, we think it's sane. So, God, I wish I had, I wish I had till midnight. I could keep going. Um, this, um, so much, so much, it all connects. So, it seems to be a bewildering world and uh, totally chaotic. And in, on the play out side, it does seem to be like that, yes. But it's not really if you take a step back. And the key thing um, that I try to get across all the time are what I call coordinates, key coordinates. Once you have these coordinates, the, the crazy kind of complex, what's it all about world, start to take on a serious level of clarity. Um, how if you control the world? A pyramid power. The idea, if you look at the way they've structured uh, society, uh, both collectively and individually, whether it's a school or a university or a government or a corporation, they structure them as pyramids. And on a collective level, they have, um, is that thing here? I've been told I have to be very careful here or I'll shut the whole thing down. That's really good, isn't it? This, they, they make a piece of technology and right next to, to, to the laser pointer is, is a a button that will shut the whole thing down. <laughs> I never went to university. Um, but, okay, um, this opens the door and this activates the nuclear weapon, okay? <laughs> the way they've structured is to hoard the knowledge, this advanced knowledge, both of what we'll be talking about now and what we talked about in the first section in the highest levels of these pyramid structures that they've created. Every organization virtually today is a pyramid. You've got the few at the top who know what the game's really about and as you come down from those few, you meet more and more and more people in these different structures but as you go down, they know less and less and less about what the organization's really about. They're just going in, making their contribution and going home. They don't know how their contribution locks into this contribution and that lock contribution, again, all innocent in and of themselves, to create anything but an innocent picture. Only they know that. So what they've done is hoarded the knowledge, not least uh, through the secret society network, and they've sucked as much of that knowledge out of circulation as they can. And their nightmare now is it started to come back. Too bloody bad, um, guys. It's about time.
And uh, this guy, Albert Pike, who was a Freemasonic god in America um, in the 1800s, sovereign grand commander, mother supreme, council of the world, and all this stuff. They love their titles, these people. Pathetic. Um, and he wrote this. This was in a, 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 a book for Freemasons. Fictions are necessary to the people, and the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it in all its brilliance. In fact, what can there be in common between the vile multitude and sublime wisdom? The truth must be kept secret, and the masses need a teaching proportional to their imperfect reason. That's what they do, is hoard the advanced knowledge and give us a fake version of reality. And this is um, the structure which shows, uh, and I'm probably being bloody optimistic where I put these people, these are the levels of presidents and prime ministers and head of NATO and stuff. This is where, within the bloodline network and the shadow people right at the top, you never see, this is where the real power is. And these people who appear to be in power are actually just vehicles to introduce what is decided there into mainstream society. George Bush is a classic. Oh, hey, there he is. Synchronicity is the next one. So people said, George Bush is big brother. What? He can't chase shoelaces. No, he's not big brother. He's just a front man. And um, if, you can, if you are in the public eye as a president and prime minister, you are by definition a front man. man they don't put their um, key people there. They put gophers there. They might be in on, in on it, a lot of them, and some of them don't. They're just manipulated, and some of them just want power and will do anything necessary for it. So they'll say, you know, we'll put you in power if you do this. Okay. Okay. And so they'll become prime minister or president. And so now it's no different. This guy reads teleprompters better than George Bush did, but apart from that, policy is pretty much the bloody same, hidden by rhetoric. Um, and in every country, including Australia, Britain, everywhere, you have um, overwhelmingly two parties, usually, that have any chance of, of forming a government. And so people think, oh, we're going to change to them now, oh, we'll change to them now. But the same force controls both sides, so whoever's in power um, is a representative of this force in the shadows. As some people say in America, um, you know, don't vote, it only encourages them. You know? Um, I've not voted for years, it's a waste of time. Do you want this mask on the face or do you want that mask on the face? No, thanks. I'll go home, thanks, have a cup of tea. <laughs> do a lot more good than voting for either of them. <laughs> this, uh, this guy, David Roskopf, is a former managing uh, director of Kissinger Associates, notorious Illuminati company, and he wrote this book... Um, last year called Superclass, in which he, he talked about a power elite um, that was making the world, but it was a cover story. It's becoming so blatant now that a few are running the show that this was a, a book to divert people away. Oh yes, there is an elite, but they're not connected, they're just loosely because they all don't, oh shut up. <laughs> it's fundamentally controlled, man. Go away, take your check, leave me alone. And so, this is how they've structured global society, of a series of pyramids within pyramids within pyramids, like Russian dolls, one inside a bigger doll, inside a bigger doll, inside a bigger doll. And so, in the end, all these different pyramids of media, banking, politics, education, media, uh, religion, all the rest of it, intelligence agencies, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, all of it, they all go are pyramids, and eventually they all answer to the same pyramid peak, which are these Illuminati families. And through this structure, they can put down from that uh, point the same policies of incessant centralization of power and other uh, changes in society, which here, as we experience them, are seem to be coming from unconnected groups and institutions and places of society, when if you go to that point, they're all coming from the same point, and that's why it's so coordinated, and that's why now it's happening so quickly, because it's so coordinated. So what you have is one force manipulating in the play-out world of the daily experience, often apparently people in conflict with each other. It's all a game. It's all a mind game. To, this is the movie I talked about earlier, and this is the secret agenda that manipulates the movie to manipulate human perception in the same way that we've seen here um, in that image. And uh, these people, in the end,